prepared. And uh, we have a couple of questions that uh, we have prepared. Uh, questions that you have asked me, questions that you may have asked Paula, but we wanted you to hear them directly from the ex experts this evening. So Paula, over to you. Okay, no problem. So uh, thank you, Sharon, for the introduction. Um, we do have a very special guest with us. We do have Ihan. She is the director of AE Associates. Uh, she is our recommended independent lawyer that uh, we recommend to our clients in North Cyprus. Um, and uh, she is very generously giving her time this evening to join us so that, as Sharon said, um, we can go through the processes um, of buying here safely in North Cyprus, talking a little bit about buying in groups, um, because we know that that's something that's uh, becoming more and more popular, um, particularly with the ladies. Um, and uh, so we will be doing it as a sort of question answer type session um, and hopefully answering everything that uh, gives you all of that information. And of course, please feel free if you've got any specific questions, please write them in the chat box um, or we will offer a, a chance for you to unmute yourselves and ask those questions directly later on. But um, thank you again, Ihan, for joining us. And Sharon, yeah, very well. do you want to start off with your questions? Because I know that there's many. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So uh, Ihan, thank you again for taking the time to come and enlighten us this evening. And our first question is based on your, on your experience as a resident and also a legal practitioner in North Cyprus, how safe would you say it is uh, as a destination for foreign real estate uh, investments. Thank you, Sharon. It's a pleasure to be with you all tonight. I'd like to wish everyone a lovely evening. Uh, first of all, I myself have been living and working in North Cyprus for 18 years now. And I can very comfortably say that in terms of real estate investment, as long as the rules are followed through completely. It's actually a very safe and risk-free jurisdiction to invest in. Um, over the years, as investment opportunities and demand has increased in North Cyprus, the government has put in various legislations and regulations to ensure that the buying process is very safe and fully protects the legal rights of the investors. So I'm very comfortably advising um, clients and purchasers to invest. However, as I said, it's very important that we are able to complete the necessary due diligence on the proposed investment to make sure that all the relevant governmental approvals have been obtained by the developer and to ensure that the titles are free and unencumbered from any charges or mortgages. To follow, there are various steps that need to be undertaken to secure the legal rights of the purchasers prior to funds being released. So if the purchasers are using a professional body um, and a legal firm to undertake the relevant conveyancing of the investment, I would say it's very safe to purchase. Thank you. And what is that legal framework for property ownership and foreign investments in North Cyprus? What does the law say specifically about that? So with, with regards to ownership, it's freehold title deed. Um, once a purchaser has fully paid for the purchase price of the property and then they pay the relevant taxes in association with the transfer of title to the government offices, freehold titles can be transferred into the name of the individuals or it can be group purchases. The number of owners to be listed on the title deed is not restricted in any way. In order for a foreign person to take transfer of title deed into their name, it is necessary for the Interior Ministry to um, grant a purchase permit 
for the purchaser. Now, this is a procedure that we undertake on behalf of the purchaser once the relevant contracts have been signed for the purchase. It's a straightforward process in that all that we require for the purchaser to provide is a CRB check from their home country or the country that they are resident in. Once this permit has been granted, then they can proceed to take transfer of the title deed into their name. Thank you. Uh, you oh. said CRB, what, what is CRB? It's a criminal record. So, for example, I know that professionals working in the medical industry or that are working with children are required to provide this to their employers. It's the same. It's a disclosure, just a basic police disclosure. Thank you. And today we wanted to zero in on trust agreements. What is a trust agreement? Okay. So we do have situations whereby individuals for various reasons may not wish to take title or contractual ownership of the property into their name directly. This may be because they want to buy more than one property or if it is a group purchase, the group may decide to use a trust whereby we have a designated trust company that is designated to only holding contractual rights and title deeds on behalf of the purchasers. If such an agreement is entered into, then we do provide a trust agreement to the beneficiaries, the legal beneficiaries of the property, whereby it is outlined that the trust company is only holding as trustee the asset and actually the legal beneficiaries are those persons listed in that agreement. The legal beneficiaries can then use the property as they wish, um, whether it's to use themselves for personal use, to rent or to resell at any stage in the future. I'll yield to Paula. I saw a question uh, come up in the in the chat, Paula. Yes, um, I have, the question is, how long does it take to do all the paperwork? I'm when we say paperwork, what, are, what are we referring it to? It might be relating to the um, permission to purchase to in order so to- normally, okay, so once the, the, normally a conveyancing process, let's start from the beginning. So once you decide to place a deposit on a property and give us instruction on the property you wish to purchase, our due diligence and contracts will take between two to three weeks. Once the contracts are signed and the first payment is released to the developer upon us registering the contract at the district lands office and securing the legal rights of the purchaser, we then submit the interior ministry application. That can take between two to six months for it to be granted. Perfect, thank you. Um, can I, if I can go back to the trust agreement, can you maybe take us through some of the clauses within the trust agreement that ensure the protection of the beneficiaries who are listed on there? How do we make sure that uh, Paula doesn't take off with <laughs> the house and maybe sell it without the rest of us knowing? So first of all, only the persons that are listed in that trust agreement have the legal right to instruct the trust um, with regards to the asset. Nobody outside the scope of that can deal with the asset or speak to the trust in respect of this. It's clearly stated what the obligations of the trust are in following through with the instructions of the beneficiaries and to at all times act only in the best interests of the beneficiaries and the asset. Um, at the same time, you know, the trust cannot be dissolved. It's a legal trust that's registered with the government offices in that context as well. Um, so it's actually, um, I'm happy to provide a copy of the trust through um, Paula later to share with yeah. 
members of the, the, the group um, this evening if they would like to see in more detail what's included in the trust. But it's a very balanced trust that doesn't actually leave any um, way for the trust to misuse its responsibilities towards the legal owners. Are there any drawbacks uh, to purchasing a property under a trust agreement? Well, there are obviously the, the only drawbacks that I can think of is there are fees that need to be paid to the trust company. And obviously the legal beneficiaries are responsible for making sure that they pay the immovable property taxes with regards to the property, because otherwise the trust is held liable for any outstanding debts. So if ever the trust was put in a situation whereby they had debts to pay for that asset on behalf of the legal beneficiaries, then obviously at that point, if the legal beneficiaries are not responding and not paying the duties and the taxes on the property, the trust could take the action to have the property sold for those debts to be paid. But this is not like an immediate decision. There are steps and processes. Of course not. There are. Uh, there's, 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 exactly. You know, there's a period whereby legal notices are sent to the beneficiaries, the legal beneficiaries, giving them sufficient time to deal with the debts of the asset. Now, obviously, this is done because sometimes legal beneficiaries simply may not respond to um, notices that are being issued, whereby if the legal beneficiaries are responding and there's an open line, a channel of communication, you know, even if there are financial issues, there can always be um, scenarios whereby this can be put right. But if all of a sudden the legal beneficiary goes quiet, does not respond, and the trust has no other option um, but to take action, then obviously there is a legal framework in place to protect both the legal beneficiary and the trustee. I, I, I think I'd just add in there as well, I think it's important that everyone understands uh, it's not just the trust where having an open conversation is important. It's important for anybody that's purchasing um, to remain open to having any conversations that may be needed. As Ihan said, you know, we all there are always different things that come up in our lives. Something can happen and all of a sudden you find yourself in the position where you may not be able to make that month's payment. But it's really important that you talk to us, you talk to the legal team um, so that that open communication remains open, um, because when it becomes closed, that's when more and more problems happen. Um, so it isn't just from a trust point of view, it's from any point of view within the buying process that I think it's important that people remember to stay open um, and, and keep communicating at all times. Great, there's a critical point, uh, uh, Paula, that you are bringing forward. And um, does the, my participation as a legal beneficiary in the trust, does that affect in any way? my control and ownership of the property? No, it does not. I'm hoping that you can expand some more. Um, do I still retain my rights as an individual or we it has to be unanimous decisions uh, every time? with my fellow uh, legal basically, beneficiaries? Basically, what we normally like to do with a group purchase is to have some kind of a joint um, agreement signed between the members of the group, whereby we can receive instruction from a leader of the group. Um, now, that is to a certain point acceptable, however, whereby there's a detrimental decision to be made with regards to the property, each person within the group would have their say. We would need to seek instruction from every individual if, for example, there was going to be a change of ownership. For example, if one member of the group decided that they wanted to share, sell their share because they're having financial difficulties, we would first of all go back to all the other group members and inform them of this situation and first give them first right of refusal to purchase the share um, and, and later on enable 
that person to sell their shares to a third person outside of the group. So at all times, um, if you are part of a group, then if there is a det detrimental decision to be made, every person's authorization would be needed. Great, thank you. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free to pop those in the chat. And I know that Paula is monitoring um, yeah. monitoring the chat. We've actually just got Joshua who's raised his hand. Joshua, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? So thank you. And I apologize, I turned late. So uh, if this has been addressed, just let me know and I'll listen to the recording. But in the case of a group purchase where the group is represented as an entity, a registered entity, the requirements that you just mentioned with sort of getting individual acknowledgement from each shareholder, would that still stand or would the entity stand on its own in, in, in that purchase? Um, thank you for the question. Now, with when you refer to an entity, if you are purchasing via the trust company, then it's not regarded as an entity. It would only be regarded as an entity if you were to form a separate company for the purpose of the investment with in, in um, the TRNC. And at that point, obviously, depending on the number of shares allocated to each person that's named and listed on the company, then their authorization and votes with regards to decisions being taken would be seeked in that way. But when it's part of the trust, unless it's stated to others, us otherwise, we would treat everybody's decision as equally binding. Um, I'm trying to frame this uh, question. I apologize, uh, Joshua, for maybe I may speak out of turn, but uh, we have a similar situation that you have uh, assisted us with, where there's a company that was formed and this company bought uh, a property in North Cyprus, but they came in as a company that is not registered in North Cyprus. And they came they in bought as a under the company. name. Yeah, they bought under the name of the company. So these two scenarios that are going through my head where the company is buying as one single, they're buying one apartment as a company registered outside and they are entering into the trust agreement directly, the company and the trust company in North Cyprus. And then the other scenario here is if this company is coming forward to enter into a trust agreement with the North Cyprus Trust, with Black Diamond, do they therefore need to bring in their individual shareholders or you regard them at the trust as one entity? You don't need to hear from the shareholders who make up this company that is coming to you as in the name of the company. The company is formed already. Now, if the... Yes, if that's, there is, yes that's the scenario. Okay. okay, so if it's a company that's formed outside of the TRNC and is using the trust in the TRNC to purchase properties, then we would need the decision and authorization of the company director. And then when it comes to detrimental decisions with regards to the property, depending on what that company's board of directors decision making structure is, we would seek to take advice and instruction from them accordingly. Right, I think that's clear. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Great. And um, one question that is often asked, you know, many times when we go into this, uh, when you're considering, this is a big decision to make uh, because of the complexities as well, is people always ask, how do I, how can I come out of it? People are often thinking about the exit. So once I get into a trust agreement, what are the exit uh, options that are available? Um, within the trust agreement, 
there are provisions to enable the legal beneficiaries to come out of the trust with regards to wanting to transfer the title into their own individual names, perhaps, and not to continue with the trust and take the responsibilities of the property title into their name. They have the option of doing this at any time within the trust agreement. They can exit by giving one month's notice to the trust in order for all the formalities to be completed. Any individual legal beneficiary can take control of their asset directly into their name or can resell their property to any third persons. When reselling, they do have the advantage of selling with the trust option, which is also quite an adv advantage to new purchasers when they're buying a property to know that the, the asset is already in a trust structure that they can just take over. Um, this is also an advantage. But to answer your question, Sharon, they, there are provisions to allow the legal beneficiary to exit at any time. Great. Can you maybe expand a little bit more on the benefits of uh, disposing of the asset under the trust? Uh, yes, of course. When selling under the trust. Yes, sure. So if, for example, the title of the property has been transferred into the name of the trust, and you are selling the property, the new purchaser has the advantage of taking over without paying the transfer taxes again to transfer the title deed into their own name. Because if, for example, you were selling the property as Sharon and had the title deed into your name, the new purchaser would need to pay 6% land registry tax to take transfer of the deeds from your name to their name. However, when it's registered in the name of the trust, all that needs to happen is for the trust agreements to be amended and new trust agreements to be issued reflecting the new purchases and reflecting that the property has been sold on in this way. Wow, I think that's a significant saving in terms of the 6%. Um, one of the ways in which uh, real estate investors get ahead is when they leverage the equity in their property, meaning that they can mortgage their current property to then get um, a loan from the bank to finance uh, second, third or fourth property. Is this feasible within a trust agreement? No, no, it's not feasible within the trust agreement because that would obligate the trust um for the loan as well as the title deeds are registered in the name of the trust and the trust would be asked to go in as a guarantor for the loan but putting that to one side remortgaging is not yet really available to foreign purchasers in north cyprus to apply for a mortgage under some circumstances whereby the title deed is issued and there's a separate title deed to the property and if 40 to 50% of the purchase price is being paid down, then a mortgage could and may be raised. But remortgages is not something that's currently offered to foreigners on the island. Okay. And um, thank you for that explanation. I know that uh, a, a foreign investor is only permitted to have one property in their name. Is, is correct. that correct? And then under that's the correct. trust, you said um, multiple properties are possible. Can you expand on that? Yes. So as foreign individuals, you can only have one property registered in your name at any one time, but there is no restriction under the trust for the trust to hold on your behalf as many properties as you wish. But I think what is important to pick from this is the trust cannot uh, get or enter into a debt relationship on behalf of the legal beneficiary. It has no legal right to do so. Okay, great. Uh, Paula, any questions from you? Any questions from our participants this morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you may be? Uh, no, there's nothing in the chat box at the moment. Ah, rental income. So uh, I'm assuming that uh, the question is around um, taxes, etc., that would be um, need to be paid if people were getting a rental income here in North Cyprus. I think that's a polar question. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is the performance of the rental market? 
Yeah, I mean, at the moment, we are seeing um, that the numbers coming to North Cyprus um, are increasing on a monthly basis, really. Um, I think probably at this point, we are seeing the most tourists that we've probably seen since just before COVID. Um, and certainly uh, the rental, um, the short term holiday rental is uh, really increasing mainly due to the fact that um, since COVID, um, people are looking to rent a property for their holiday on their own. Um, you know, either a one bedroom unit or, you know, maybe a villa for a large family or a couple of families, but they want that opportunity to um, have their own space. Yes, they want to be able to go and visit the five star hotels and use the um, beach facilities for the day or, you know, they want to go out to a restaurant in the evening, but they want to have their own space. So we're really seeing um, that the holiday rental tourism is increasing. We also have a very big medical tourism uh, opportunity here as well. Um, medical uh, treatments are very much better value here than they would be in Europe or the US or the UK. Um, and so we are seeing a lot of people coming here just for medical treatments. Um, and of course, you know, that extends what we would see as our general holiday period. We do have an extended holiday period here from sort of the beginning of May to the end of October anyway. But medical tourism is making that sort of holiday rental 11 months of the year. Um, because, of course, if you're coming for medical treatment, you know, you don't necessarily want to come in the middle of July. Um, so we are seeing that the increases of rental opportunities are, you know, are increasing all the time. Uh, if you're looking at seeing, um, you know, what the sort of prices are per night, um, as an example, at this time of the year, a one bedroom apartment um, would probably see anything between 80 and 120 pound per night. And of course that's dependent on the location that it's in, you know, is it in um, a sort of larger resort where there are lots of facilities to be had. Um, it can be dependent on the types of um, furniture and equipment that you have in there. You know, for example, just having a simple coffee, you know, Nespresso machine, um, it can be something that, you know, people think, OK, I'll rent this property, even though it may be five or ten pounds a night more expensive rather than this property, because it has these certain extras to it. Um, but uh, if you're looking at the average amount of nights um then most developers that have their rental management teams in place um they will say to you that you'll be looking at around 150 to 200 nights per year now that's taking it on a slightly less basis generally but of course you know they don't want to over promise and under deliver um but, you know, if you if you take, you know, a one bedroom unit, an average of, say, £100 a night and you base it over 150 nights a year, it will give you an idea of the type of uh, rental income that you could come to expect. There's a follow up question there, Paula. Uh, so is the amount that you mentioned good or not? Um, I'm assuming they're talking about the night nightly rate um as i said that's an average it can be more than that we are expecting that obviously these prices they are increasing um you know obviously just after covid there wasn't any way of getting a hundred pounds a night for a one bedroom unit um so these prices are increasing and the developers when they're putting together these off-plan projects those of you that have been to North Cyprus, you will know that they are looking at more and more facilities in their projects. So it isn't just about having, uh, you know, a couple of apartment blocks with a swimming pool on site. They're looking at the restaurants. 
they're looking at um, spa facilities, a sauna, an indoor pool, a gym. Um, and then we're seeing more and more now that they're providing um, workspaces, communal workspaces. Um, some of them are providing more sports facilities like tennis courts and basketball courts. Um, some of them are providing sort of small cinema rooms and conference rooms and things like that. So they're looking at different ways of increasing the facilities and thereby increasing potential rental uh, returns as well. Paula, I would like to make a note here that one of our Friday fiestas, we should take a deeper dive into um unpacking the how to calculate the return on investment um like show me the money where's the money in all this so uh take notes to our participants this evening we are coming back and we'll have someone to unpack it and then we'll show you the money where's the money when you're doing real estate investment rental income is one stream but it's not the only stream and uh, Paula, there are a couple of questions that have popped yes. up there. So given the history of Northern Cyprus, are there any restrictions on USA, UK, EU residents or citizens doing business with North Cyprus uh, by investing in North Cyprus? No, there are no restrictions to anybody investing in North Cyprus. Um, any person from any country can come and invest here. Um, and uh, we don't offer citizenship, we don't offer visas like that, um, but anybody that invests in North Cyprus, if they wish to, they can take out residency here. Um, that would be more for people that wish to come and go more often to their holiday property, for example, um, but basically um, those of you that are from like the UK, uh, when you want to come out on holiday here, it's easy. You can fly into South Cyprus, you can fly into North Cyprus. Um, again, the same with those from EU, the same from the US. Uh, it's very easy to travel in and out um, and to invest here. Um, I was asking more about restrictions from the above named foreign governments. Um, as far as I know, no, but let's Ihan, could you comment on, on that last question? Um, so restrictions from the different governments, the foreign governments about investing here. There are no restrictions from the governments that were listed in that chat right now. Actually, I don't know of any restrictions no. of any government um, in respects of investing in North Cyprus. No, and the, the, other, the other important point is that Currently, um, of course, things change all the time, but currently um, North Cyprus actually does not share any tax information with any other country apart from America. Um, so, again, a lot of investors are investing in North Cyprus because of that. So if your money is here, if it's being used here, um, your investment in property here that information won't be shared with your home country's um, government. Um, Ihan, I just asked you to verify that that is correct. Yes, we don't have a scheme whereby um, the information with regards to the investors are available online. All the information is private and confidential. The TRNC government and the tax office do not disclose any information about any person, regardless of what country they live in or which citizenship they hold. So um, as Paula said, the only time that this does not apply is for US citizens. Right. I, I think also the question, I've been asked this question before, it comes from a, the way I have been asked it before, it was to how to confirm the legitimacy of the existence of uh, North Cyprus, for example, and where if there are some international banks, for example, that we are familiar with, Barclays, whatever, we don't seem to see those in North, uh, in North Cyprus. And um, flights, for example, where uh, you don't see your usual 
BA coming into North Cyprus, what is the impact of that? And what does it mean for me as a foreign investor? Because it's always comforting to see the familiar. Well, first of all, North Cyprus is not an internationally recognized country. I mean, this is, it, it's still a developing country in that sense. And this is part of why it's so favorably looked upon in terms of investment, because there is still a large potential for investors to gain a return on their investment. You know, it's still, despite there being a boom, a property boom on the island for the past 10 to 14 years, there's still, when you compare the prices of property here in North Cyprus to the south, which is officially part of the EU, you know, the same property with the same specification, almost the same location, it's three times more expensive in the south. So, you know, there's a lot of advantages. Now, having said that, North Cyprus is recognized by Turkey. Um, most of the banks that you can see here, apart from the local North Cyprus banks, are actually mainland Turkish banks. Uh, for example, you know, there is Ishbank. Now, Ishbank is also uh, has an existence and a presence in the UK, for example, and in other countries. Um, you have Hulkbank, which again is in the UK and other countries as well. So this in itself is very significant because although you don't see the banks that you're used to, for example, like Barclays or HSBC, um, there are banks that you can find in other international countries that are here. And that is because Turkey is the only country that officially recognizes North Cyprus. Great, thank you. And what I hear from you as well, it's, it's about a shift, right, in terms of who decides what is international and uh, who makes that determination. I wanted to, I'm, I'm mindful of the time. One of the questions that I'm often asked is, what happens when I'm in a trust agreement? What happens when I die? So how does the trust uh, agreement impact uh, inheritance and estate planning considerations? So first of all, there's no inheritance tax in North Cyprus. Um, in the event that the legal beneficiary of the trust was to pass away, um, their share in that asset would pass on to whoever their legal beneficiaries may be. Now, it's possible to have a will drawn up in North Cyprus and lodged with the North Cyprus courts, whereby in the event of that person's decease, members of that, uh, pro the, that will would automatically be part of the probate and the legal share would pass to them. If there is not a will in North Cyprus, then again, the legal beneficiaries of the deceased would have to come forward and prove that they are the next in kin um, and the heirs to that asset. And again, the probate would enable for them to take transfer of that share of the asset. And what are the steps and the costs for uh, setting up a will in North Cyprus? Well, you do need to be present in North Cyprus because your will would be drawn out by us. Once you've read and approved the will, we would need to visit the court registrar office together, whereby your will would be signed by you there and lodged with the court registrar office. It costs about £350 to have a will lodged. Great, thank you. And uh, I had a question on the numbers. Um, after I've purchased the property, I know that there are some taxes that uh, here would call them closing costs. What are those additional expenses? I know they stamp duty. You talked about a 6% uh, tax. What other financial considerations are there in terms of uh, closing off on the property? Okay, so first of all, you have your legal fee, which is in the region of £2,000. You then have the stamp duty, which is 0 0.5. The contract needs to be stamped at the tax office in order for it to be valid and binding. You would then need to register the contract at the district lands office. If you're purchasing in your own individual name, then at that point, you would need to pay 6% land registry tax. If you're purchasing via the trust, the 6% does not need to be paid at that point. 
later on when you are ready to take transfer of the title deed. Again, if you're taking transfer of the title into your own individual name, a further 6% is payable. And the same for if you're taking transfer of the title deed into the name of the trust, again, 6% is payable. So the difference here is if you're also, if you're buying from a developer at the time of transfer of title deed, you would need to pay 5% VAT. Mm -hmm. So in, it's when we look at it, if you're purchasing as an individual, in total, you would need to budget for 17.5% taxes throughout the purchase that would take you to transfer of title deed into your name. Okay. And then, and then about in, and then if you're purchasing via the trust, about eleven and a half percent. All right, that's very helpful. Uh, would there be any other questions? There's nothing else in the chat box. So hopefully we've answered quite a lot of questions. We've covered a lot of information. <laughs> As well. <laughs> yes, I do. And <laughs> what normally happens is after a call like this, I get a lot of text messages and calls. But uh, right after this call, I'm getting on the road and getting on that Texas adventure. And I promise if you do send a message, I will get to it this evening. It's still morning over here. So I have lots of time to respond to your questions. And uh, if you already bought and you need to, you need some help understanding the agreement, do reach out to myself or Paula and we will uh, get you in touch with not necessarily Ahan herself, but uh, someone from her office. So thank you so much, Ahan. I know we are standing between you and your weekend, uh, <laughs> Paula. <laughs> no, it's, all, Sharon. it's always a pleasure, always. Thank you very much for having me this evening. And I hope that I answered most of the questions. Um, as, as you said, Sharon, whenever there's any more questions that spring to mind, um, myself and members of my team will always be happy to answer them. Thank you so Great. much. Thank you. Yes. All right, ladies. We will have a recording available to you. Um, as soon as it's been uploaded, I will forward it to Sharon and she will forward it on to everybody. Um, but I think if there aren't any other questions, Sharon, I think we have come to the end of the session. Thank you. It's a Fiesta <laughs> Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go and enjoy. Have a lovely weekend, weekend everyone. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.